they say we can start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining our conversation about the impacts of the climate crisis on health. Um, I am very pleased to be joined by our director uh, of Climate Change, Environment and Health Department, uh, Dr. Maria Neira. Um, hi, Maria. Thank you for finding the time to talk to our social media audience about this very important subject. Thank you, Alice. A great pleasure. This is very exciting. First day, so as you can imagine, everybody is very excited here. So, pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And um, I actually haven't told our viewers where you are um, because I want to I want you to explain where you are uh, joining us from and also what is that interesting sculpture behind you? Okay, we are in Sharm el Sheikh. As you know, the conversations, the negotiations of the COP27 are starting right now. And here at the moment, I am at the health pavilion of the World Health Organization, which represents not only the World Health Organization, I think we have the whole global health community behind us. And more importantly, Alice, I'm sure you can see a beautiful sculpture. What is the meaning of this beautiful sculpture? I think, I hope everybody got it. It represents our lungs. And the reasons why we want to have the lungs at the center of the COP27 negotiation is to remind everyone how much we are connected to the climate negotiations. If we don't tackle the causes of climate change, the price will be paid by our lungs. This is done by an artist. This is really beautiful. You should see it uh, properly. And in addition to that, it represents our lungs and the trees. So it's a very artistic uh, link in nature and our health. And if you touch it, it represents the, the, the blood that is circulating at the same level that it will be circulating life in our trees. So I think uh, we hope that this image will attract a lot of visitors and will finally make that linkage between climate change and health. They are so much connected. Thank you, Maria. And let's start with lungs then. How is actually climate crisis connected to our lungs and how it's hurting our lungs? Okay, uh, as you know, climate change is responsible for this global warming. This global warming is of course responsible for many natural disasters, flooding, uh, you saw it now in all the headlines, in all the newspapers. We can see how we have a drought, floods, major natural disasters which are clearly destroying the life and the well-being of many people and then creating even massive displacement and a lot of suffering and, and very uh, unfair situations. But in addition to that, if you have a flood or if you have a drought uh, you will have the, you will not be able to produce uh, uh, agriculture. I mean, you will not be able to produce food. So we will have major problems of uh, undernutrition because of that lack of capacity to, to uh, produce uh, uh, any, any food if you destroy the land. On another hand, we will have issues related to lack of access to safe water and sanitation. Those are the very direct uh, consequences of uh, climate change. But we have as well the, 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 the fact that this global warming is creating perfect conditions for certain vectors that are transmitting diseases. And I'm sure that everybody will remember those mosquitoes responsible for malaria or mosquitoes responsible for transmitting dengue. And we know that this global warming will create the perfect conditions to have those diseases and increase, a very important increase, in areas where we didn't see it before. Of course, if we go even farther with the consequences of climate change, you, know, you have the, the heat waves. We, we have now in our cities, um, in the last 20 years, we saw an increase of at least two-thirds of the, the deaths caused by exposure to those heat waves in the cities in particular and by very vulnerable people. So, if you link all of those consequences, you, you realize that climate change is touching the basic pillars of our health, 
food, shelter, the air we breathe, and the water we drink. In addition to that, the causes of climate change are very much related to the combustion of fossil fuels. This combustion of fossil fuels creates pollution of the air we breathe, and that pollution, Alex, is today responsible for more than 7 million premature deaths every year. So with all of those reasons, I think it's very much justified the fact that WHO is present here reminding everyone that this is very, very much about human health. Thank you so much, Maria, and um, I, for this great in introduction. I would like to use the opportunity to remind our viewers how they can send their questions. If they are watching us on Facebook, they can use the comment section. If they are watching us on Twitter, they can uh, use the hashtag AskWHO. We are monitoring those questions and I will pass them to Maria, so please send them in. Uh, she's joining us from COP27 and making a strong argument why health should be at the center of negotiations um, on climate action. Um, Maria, we have received a question. You mentioned the co combustion of fossil fuels, um, driving air pollution, and that's harming our health, but also driving the climate change. So Melissa Terry says, thank you for caring and for what you are doing to protect our health. And she's asking, how many years of fossil fuels do we have left? How many years of fossil fuels we have? Uh, left. Left. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, if it was my decision, I would say less than one. But unfortunately, it will be the decision of all the policymakers meeting here at Sharm el -Sheikh. I think if we look at all the win-wins that we will have, if we are able to transit to a more sustainable and cleaner sources of energy, that will be the first decision to be taken. If we move from uh, the combustion of fossil fuels to cleaner, renewable sources of energy, we will tackle the causes of uh, climate change, of course. We will reduce dramatically the, the causes of uh, uh, carbon emissions. Second, we will reduce air pollution and therefore we will be able to save lives and, and diseases and reduce the cost that the health system is already paying. And that cost is uh, enormous. The societies, the governments are already paying that without knowing that they are investing and giving still subsidies to fossil fuels. Uh, on the other hand, you will be uh, uh, having benefits as well on jobs, green jobs. You will have benefits on the more sustainable society, uh, societies, better food system production, so only benefits. Now, the, the renewables, the, the, uh, the, the solar, for instance, energy is now cheaper than ever. So the reasons that a few years ago politicians or policymakers were using uh, for um, going with, uh, on a slow way to this transition to renewables are not valid anymore because uh, today is a cheap technology, it's affordable, and uh, if we are smart with the crisis we have at the moment on energy sources, that will be the, 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 the good thing to do. For the health community, this is extremely important because uh, if we keep combusting fossil fuels, we are literally killing ourselves, filling our hospitals with uh, chronic diseases, and of course affecting our beautiful lungs that we are representing here today. Not only lungs, you know, air pollution is responsible for many diseases, it's affecting all organs of our body, including our brain. So I think uh, if our politicians are smart enough and they realize uh, the, the, the benefits that they could obtain on accelerating this uh, healthy energy transition, I think they will do it tomorrow. But unfortunately, we still need some transition and uh, hopefully we will push and use the health argument to accelerate the speed as much as possible. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, we have a question from Motika Ko Irala, who is asking about concrete steps and precautions that WHO is taking or recommending countries to take uh, to mitigate the impacts of climate change or to prevent them. 
Very simple. WHO is trying to pass very positive messages. We, we all know the disaster that climate change represents for our health. Therefore, we want now to transform it in something positive that will uh, stimulate action. And then we have very clear prescriptions. One, we need to stop destroying the ecosystems. We depend on our ecosystems to have our food, our air, our uh, water, our shelter our drugs, our medicines, everything is, is coming from the ecosystem. So we need to stop destroying and, and polluting and, and putting tons of plastic in our oceans. Uh, that is really creating a, 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 a only the bad conditions for our health. Second, we are asking governments to stop giving subsidies to fossil fuels. Uh, the money they are giving now for, for fossil fuels uh, could be used much better on accelerating this transition, and that will reduce the cost that that's our hospitals are already uh, paying for that. We are asking countries as well to accelerate this transition to, to clean sources of energy. That will have enormous benefits. To invest on sustainable food systems, and to accelerate as well a transition to healthy urban planning. Uh, our cities are the ones where we can reduce dramatically the emissions uh, uh, that are responsible for climate change, that are responsible for 70% of all the emissions, and therefore accelerating for a more uh, sustainable transport system, uh, energy efficiency in our buildings, a more uh, uh, less uh, uh, polluted and, and environment in our cities, that will have enormous and fantastic benefits. So WHO will keep in providing evidence. We will be monitoring the air pollution, promoting as well the measures to reduce it, and we will be uh, promoting uh, adaptation and, and resilience of our health systems. And of course, we will be leading by example. And we can maybe talk, if you want, later on of the initiative on decarbonizing the health systems. Thank you, Maria. Yes, I think we're going to come back to the health system and, and health workers' role in, in, in this climate action and WHO's recommendations. Uh, we got a question from Idris Usman Shal, who is asking, what's the role of a common man in combating climate change? We are talking, we're talking about politicians and policymakers who do need to make the, the biggest decisions and changes, but how individuals can protect themselves or help. Very good question, and, and I think uh, all of us as individuals, we have a very critical role to play. First at all, because we can vote. So our vote is very important. Make sure that when you use your vote, you vote the right politicians who will be taking care of uh, climate change and tackling the causes of climate change because your health other ways will be suffering. As individuals as well, there are many things we can do. We need to lead by example. Instead of taking your car every day, come on, use the, the public transport or walk or use a bicycle. Convince others to do it. Be very conscious of the way you use water and electricity. Be very uh, committed to your community and recycle all your waste. <coughs> Make sure as well that you, you create groups of influence. You, you, if you are a teacher, do something with your, um, at your school. If you are a health professional, many things that we will discuss later on that you can do. But always consider that your, your contribution, even if a small one, will have an impact. And as an individual, we need to influence around us as many as possible, wherever you are, you will have a level of influence. But of course, put pressure on your governments because those are the ones, or on your mayors at the city level because they have a big capacity to take decisions and to have impact on uh, what will affect you. Thank you so much, Maria. And um, maybe maybe we can, we can talk now about our initiatives to um, improve health system resilience, but also to make their sources of energy greener. Um, can you tell us about that, please? Yes. Yes, this is very, very exciting and very rewarding. And, it, and again, something very positive that will give you hope. Uh, the health professionals, they still, we still have a credibility on the population. So we cannot just keep 
just uh, treating asthma patients without uh, investigating on checking where this asthma patient lives, whether you treat the patient and then it goes back to live on a very polluted street in London or somewhere else. So we need to, to as a professionals of the health, of health, we need to look at the conditions of our people and try to influence those, those conditions. But on our hospitals, on our healthcare facilities, at the moment, globally, the contribution of the health system to the carbon footprint is around 5% of the global total. So it's, 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 it's quite uh, substantial as a number. If we were a country, the health system, if it was a country, we will be number five in terms of contribution to the, the global carbon footprint. So because we need to operate our hospitals and we need all of this intensive energy, we need to transition and decarbonize our health system. So WHO, together with uh, the UK presidency last year in, at Glasgow, and this year supported by the presidents of Egypt, together with 62 countries, we have launched an initiative called ATTACH, which is how we transfer the health systems to make it less <laughs> contributors to the, 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 the carbon footprint. So we will decarbonize, looking at uh, the supply chain, looking at the procurement, look at all the plastics we use that maybe we don't, and transforming the sources of energy at our hospitals. This is very rewarding. All the health professionals are on it. And some countries like an NHS in UK are so committed as to go for uh, zero carbon or carbon neutral by 2040. So very stimulating. On the other hand, you have many other healthcare facilities in sub-Saharan African countries, for instance, that not only they are not contributing to the carbon footprint, they need to have access, gain access to electricity. So we want to do it by electrifying those healthcare facilities with solar energy. That will be the way that the health sector will unite it and be motivated and create these uh, systems which are carbon neutral, will uh, create some uh, facilities for, for, for isolated healthcare facilities, and at the same time create a movement that uh, motivate all the health professionals in a very positive way and leading by example as well. Thank you very much, Maria. And maybe you can also tell us about the initiatives to create, uh, to make health system more uh, resilient uh, from all those uh, extreme weather events that you mentioned at the beginning, like floods, fires uh, that we've seen happening and like most recently devastated floods in Pakistan. So how can we make sure that our health systems are resilient as those weather events can happen to, to any place? Yeah, thanks. Whatever we do or they do, our politicians here at the COP27 to uh, tackle the causes of climate change, we still have uh, to adapt uh, because there will be consequences no matter what decisions are taken. Many countries are already suffering the consequences of climate change. We see those uh, forests disappearing. We see those uh, natural disasters and flooding. So the health system is already suffering and is already at the front line uh, suffering the consequences of climate change. We need to make sure that at least that there will be better prepared, be more resilient to climate change. So we have lunch. This is one of the health commitments at the COP26 to make our healthcare facilities more resilient, more sustainable. What is that? Is it goes from, from the beginning, where do you build those facilities, making sure that you make it more uh, uh, resilient in case there is a natural disaster, how you prepare the health professionals, how you prevent vector-borne diseases or waterborne diseases that will be very much affected, and how you provide them with some financial resources to get better prepared for that. That's why it's so important that the, the Green Climate Fund and other facilities, other financial mechanisms to trans channel some uh, financial resources to those healthcare facilities to be better prepared and coping with whatever uh, uh, the, the, the climate change will bring to them because in any case, they, they will be suffering even if we stop tomorrow the carbon emissions 
they they still will be suffering uh, and uh, the damages of those healthcare facilities we saw it in Pakistan recently is 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 horrible they they were simply disappearing and those who were did not disappear they suffer major damages and they need to still provide resources and, and assistance to many people so more we can work with them the better Thank you so much, Maria. And we have a question here from Jaya Kumar, who is one of our regular viewers of, 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 across topics that we are doing those live Q&As. Uh, he's asking if you can kindly explain about different types of pollution other than air, which can harm human body. Kindly brief about how to control water pollution. Sorry, I couldn't hear the last part of your question, Alice. So he's asking about different pollutants to human body, uh, besides air, and in particular about how to control water pollution. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, we talk a lot about air pollution and these pollution, pollutants coming from combustion of fossil fuels, but it's true that uh, as humans, I'm afraid we are polluting everything we touch these days. We produce plastics that end up in our oceans and then they end up in the fish that we eat and we have been able to find now plastic in our blood which is quite worrying we have uh, pollutants and uh, microplastics and uh, many others in our water and that's why we 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 look at when you we look at climate change we are very conscious that one of the consequences will be water scarcity and if there is a pollution and uh, the, the, the scarcity of the water resources, that will be even more dangerous. So water is very much at the, at the heart as well of all of, all of our environmental agenda. We have uh, all of those chemicals pollutants that are uh, endocrine disrupting pollutants that are causing as well a problem, um, pesticides, residues, and uh, uh, forever chemicals that are uh, very much present in our life. And therefore, everything is started, as I mentioned before, by respecting nature, stopping destroying the ecosystems and polluting everything. We need to be very conscious of what we use, what we consume, because all of that will end up in our body and affecting our health. So a, a, a zero pollution strategy or a green deal as the European Union is putting in place now is very much needed in all fronts to protect our health. Thank you so much, Maria. And we are having a very good question from Abdullahi Mohammed. What is the biggest health concern associated with the warming climate? Uh, Alessandra, this is getting a little bit noisy because it's full of people around here. So what is the biggest concern? Sorry, can you repeat? Yes. What is the biggest health concern associated with the warming climate? Oh, thank you. Well, at the moment, I think it's very much related to this pollution, exposure to pollution, whether the pollution is coming from the combustion of fossil fuels or is coming from the use of electronic waste that, that end up as well in us, or is coming from plastic pollution or is coming from chemicals pollution. So I think if we look at all the deaths caused by exposure to environmental risk factors, we reach one quarter of all deaths annually means 12 million deaths every year that are occurring every year are related to exposure to environmental risk factors that we could modify. So if we are wiser and if we reduce this uh, uh, war that we have at the moment with nature, uh, we could reduce dramatically this pollution in, in the water, in the air, and in the, in the food we eat. It. That will be the, the major health concern, pollution, pollution, pollution. Thank you so much, Maria. And maybe before we close, can you tell us what are the WHO expectations from COP27? We have the highest possible. I mean, we, we are coming here with the lungs. So let me show you properly. Look at this. This is, isn't it beautiful? This is our representation on how much health and climate change are related. So our expectations 
the highest possible. We want then to reach an agreement to stop this global warming, to accelerate this transition to uh, clean sources of energy, and we can measure the benefits that will be, this will be generating and how the debts will start to go down. So very high expectations, but uh, we will not give up. Uh, the health of our people is uh, definitely the best possible mission we can have here. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, we wish you best of luck uh, during the COP27. We we have a strong team on the ground um, advocating for protection of human health. Um, and I would like to thank can, uh, people who are watching us from Nepal, Philippines, Canada, India, Mexico, Thailand, Fiji, Mongolia, Guatemala, Peru, Zambia, the US, DRC, uh, Ivory Coast, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Guyana, Kenya, Australia, Brazil, Bangladesh, Liberia, and many others. Uh, thank you for following this conversation. Uh, thank you for supporting and doing your part to protect health from climate crisis and other pollutants, as Maria was um, explaining. Um, Maria, any final words from you for our viewers? Dear participants, all focus on the, this COP is so important for our health. The decisions here, if they are good, there will have a positive impact in our health. If not, there will have a very negative impact in our health. So keep posted and keep pushing. Thank you so much, Maria. And yes, before we uh, finish this conversation, I'm inviting our viewers to follow us uh, across social media channels and on the website for the updates from COP27. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.